Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is the epic fail of Arturo Zamora for Mrs. Esposito's classroom, and we are going to begin chapter two. So you should have your book open, and you should be tracking along as you listen to me read. Okay, here we go. Chapter two, Death by Soap Monsters. I woke up the next morning to the sound of my Hulk alarm blasting, Hulk smash, in my ear. My first thought, right after, this thing is way too loud, was about dinner last night. Why had I acted so weird around Carmen? It was probably nothing. I was just excited to see an old friend or something. Anyway, I was pumped about starting work at the restaurant. The money I made over the summer was always enough for plenty of movies on the weekends, a new basketball, at least one new pair of kicks, and a whole school year's worth of weekend ice cream trips to two scoops, conveniently located around the corner from La Cocina de la Isla. My mom and dad had already left to buy the morning vegetables for the day's menu. They saved me some tortilla española and a pie pan on the counter. Tortilla española is a great breakfast meal. It's perfect at any temperature, and the egg, onion, and potato fill you up after one slice. I shoveled a whole piece into my mouth, grabbed my keys, and started walking to the restaurant. I had proven myself last summer when I was the second assistant junior lunch reservations phone operator. That job was cool because I was on the phone all day and got to sit in a really comfortable office chair. More than once, I was told I had a really nice speaking voice. I turned the corner from our apartment complex and walked a few blocks to the main strip where all the restaurants and shops in Canal Grove were located. And there it was, our colorful sign. The O in Cocina was bright orange while the rest of the letters were outlined in green and black, and behind the letters was the faint shape of an island. Two multicolored giraffes greeted customers at the entrance of the restaurant, making an arch as you walked through the French double doors. Giraffes were Abuela's favorite animal. I liked them because they were tall and lanky and had big eyes that always looked happy, like Abuela. Yolanda was already inside, unfolding chairs while Marie rolled up forks, knives, and spoons inside napkins. Color defined La Cocina de la Isla. Every bright hue imaginable covered every inch of the interior. Green, orange, yellow, teal. La Cocina was cheerful. It had been like that since Abuela had first opened it 19 years ago. My dad had had the walls repainted recently, and even though the paint had already faded a little, it still looked vibrant and fresh. Out back, there was a little courtyard with stone columns and an ancient-looking coral stage that was part of the building structure. In the courtyard, we hosted countless weddings, birthdays, engagements, anniversaries, and every other kind of party you could imagine. The hallways leading to the kitchen were covered in picture frames. There was a young abuela sitting at one of the tables with the U.S. senator and his wife, and another picture where she was sitting with the famous musician Celia Cruz, one where she was being hugged by Gloria and Emilio Estefan. She had taken dozens of photos with telenovela actors, local newscasters, and writers who'd passed through town. One of my favorite photos was of my mom and abuela smiling as abuela symbolically handed my mom a ladle when she took over as head chef. Another picture showed my mom accepting her first major cooking award, the Newbie Chef Challenge competition on the Food is Life Network. Next to that, a picture of my first basketball team, the Islanders. Abuela bought jerseys for all the players on the team. She'd done that for every one of my sports teams since I was five. There was a picture of Vanessa accepting the Outstanding Community Citizen Award, the youngest person to ever win it. Mari and Yolanda dressed in their prom outfits after they decided they would be each other's dates. A large wedding photo of my parents. There was one of Aunt Tootie, my mom, and Uncle Carlos as kids with Abuela and Abuelo at the beach. Compare that to the one of me and all my cousins huddled around Abuela when we were really small. Vanessa and I were cuddled in Abuela's arms. Everything about La Cocina came back to family. I think that's why so many customers loved it. When they came here, they felt like family too. That was how Abuela wanted it. I approached the office and waited for my mom to finish her phone call so she could tell me what job I would have. When she hung up, she reached over to a rack and pulled a white chef coat off a hanger. What's my job, mom? I asked, suddenly excited that she wanted me to be a line cook or something. You're going to be the junior lunchtime dishwasher. The air escaped my lungs. Huh? is all I could muster. Didn't you say you wanted to work in the kitchen this year, she asked. Well, yes, but I was thinking something else, you know, like like a prep cook or something. Dishwasher is probably the most important job in the kitchen, Arturo. If dishes aren't clean, we can't serve our customers. Tune your lunchtime dishwasher? It was the worst job ever. I wasn't happy, but I didn't show it. My mother was a no-nonsense chef and boss. 
Her cooks were respectfully terrified of her. As a dishwasher, I was at the very bottom of the kitchen hierarchy, so I needed to follow the rules and not mess up. Besides, I just had to work three dishwashing shifts a week. What was the worst that could happen? As soon as I entered the kitchen, Martine threw an apron at me. You're late. I looked at the clock. It was one minute after nine. Martine followed my eyes and pointed to the clock. That clock is not your friend. I am not your friend. I am your boss. You are expected to be here at nine o'clock. I better see you here at 8.55, at least. Five minutes before your shift. Not one minute after your shift. Understand? Understand? Martine smelled like fried croquetas and a heavy helping of Miro Bro deodorant. I turned my face away. Aurelia was out sick today, so you've been promoted from junior dishwasher to assistant prep kitchen dishwasher. Think you can handle it? I nodded and put on the apron. I practically lived at my family's restaurant, but being here at this moment in this role felt different. My mom was the chef, but nobody was going to give me special treatment, especially not Martine. What are you scanning around for? Nobody's here to protect you. You might be the favorite out there, but in this kitchen, you're mine. Could he read minds now? He shoved me over to the large dishwashing machine in the corner. There were more levers, buttons, and gauges than the Mission Control Center at NASA. The thing looked like it could transform into a towering 60-foot robot at any minute. I guess I had never bothered to pay attention to the dishwasher before. It's funny how you can know a place so well and still discover something new and slightly terrifying about it. This is El Monstro. Mess with it, and it will eat you. Pull this lever, press this button, wait for the cycle to finish. The rack spits out, the dirty water drains. More blue water fills up the tray. Slide another rack into the blue cleaning soap. Dry the rack that comes out. Put it on this dolly. When the dolly is stacked with racks, roll it out and give it to the busboy. The busboy distributes everything to the restaurant. You do it all over again. Think you can handle that, Chiroso? Chiroso meant filthy one. Like he should talk. Martin looked like Jabba the Hutt wearing a chef coat. He pressed a button and El Monstro vibrated to life, hissing angrily like, he'd wo- like we'd woken it up from a nice nap. The first rack of greasy pots and pans slid onto the table and the dishwasher let out a hiss of steam as the rack splashed into the pool of blue water. The plates kept piling up and, with minutes, and within minutes the glass racks were out of control. I inspected the slimy disaster that was my workstation. After about five or six plates, the blue water looked more like a zombie made out of food bits, preparing to rise up and strangle me in a soggy coil of old grease, chewed up fried egg, and tomato criollo. Dirty water covered my face. Martine returned carrying a tower of filthy frying pans. By the time I turned around, he was already tossing them into the air. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, Martine said, flinging each one like a frisbee. I didn't have time to react, so each pan torpedoed into the blue water and, like a depth charge, held on for a moment before blowing up in my face. I tried to cover my Miami heat shirt by shielding myself, but it was no use. The apron protected nothing. I was soaked. Ah, pobrecito, cracked Martine. Did Turoso ruin his little basketball titi? Serves you right for working too slow. I looked at the clock. I wasn't going to let El Monstruo beat me. I focused on the incoming racks and moved them through the newly filled blue water and into the machine. I pulled the lever and pressed the button and dried the first rack, then the next and the next. Soon the dolly filled up. Martine glanced over and scoffed, pointing to a tiny speck on one of the plates. Do you think our customers are going to let grime with their plantain mash, Chiroso? I shook my head, frustrated but determined not to let Jabba the chef get to me. Clean this one again. He shoved the plate into my chest and made me hand wash it in front of him. He crossed his arms and waited as I tried to rub the tiny speck off the plate. More, he said. I want to see my face in it. I could hear him breathing heavily, and the mix of food and really strong deodorant was making me nauseous. The little spot finally came off, and I handed the plate back to him. He inspected it and then walked back to his station to continue prepping for lunch. Get back to work, he said, and mumbled something about me under his breath. The other racks continued to pile up. The restaurant hadn't even opened yet, and I needed to wash more than 20 racks. I found out later that the pots and pans got a steam and al monstro and then were cleaned with the olive oil before the restaurant opened. Because cast iron is dense and takes time to heat up, the steam started the job, and then the heat from the stove tops did the rest. The plates and glasses got steam to remove any spots or grime left from the night before. 
Aurelio, the regular dishwasher, did this every morning, but today, but today the job had fallen to me and it was brutal. By the time I finished with the early morning dish prep, I had practically drowned in soap bubbles. I hung my... I hung up my apron and looked out at the dining room to find that Abuela had arrived. The restaurant had just opened, but customers were already waving her over, dying for some one-on-one time with her old friend. She sat at a table with a group of ladies. Even though she was older, she hardly ever slouched. Abuela always dressed like she was on her way to a fancy party. She either wore lots of jewelry, always her shiny silver necklace with cross and oval pendant, or silky scarves with colorful prints. I once bought her a scarf with giraffes on it for her birthday. She said it was her absolute favorite scarf of all time. Customers accepted her friendly kisses. She admired the necklace of one woman at the table, taking it in her hands. The lady's name was Martha, and she owned a jewelry shop a few stores down from La Cocina. She was a lunch regular. Abuela got up and lovingly rubbed Martha's shoulder before going to another table. Abuela took small steps toward a group having a business lunch, and they immediately stopped their serious discussion to speak with her. One of the men got up from his chair and offered it to Abuela, while a lady in a suit moved over excitedly to make room. They were a group of lawyers from Cohen, Carr, and Crespo, a a law firm at the far end of Main Street. Every Monday, without fail, they walked in rain, heat, or humidity to La Cocina to have lunch and get their week started. Abuela never stayed at a table too long. Sometimes she cleared a plate or refilled water glasses. We had 20 tables in the restaurant, and it was always packed. There was hardly room to move around it when it was completely full, but Abuela always made her way to every single table. Aunt Tootie rushed over to help her, but Abuela politely brushed her youngest daughter away. Aunt Tootie shook her head nervously as she walked back to the hostess stand, mumbling before seating another guest. Behind me, the kitchen door swung open and my mom walked through, wearing her signature uniform, a bright orange chef coat with kari and fancy cursive in the upper left side. She had a La Cocina baseball cap on her head and a newspaper under her arm. How was your first day? My mom asked, stopping in front of me. Good, except the dishwasher almost ate me. She laughed and was about to turn into the office when she saw Abuela. When did Abuela get here? She was already here when I finished my shift. My mom went over to Aunt Tootie at the hostess stand. Aunt Tootie started flailing her arms, and my mom kept shaking her head while watching Abuela happily chat with a couple. I recognized them because they'd had their engagement party at La Cocina a couple of months ago. Their names were Annabelle and George. My mom walked over to the couple, said hello, and then turned to walk away, smiling uncomfortably as she tried to get Abuela to follow her. I noticed how differently people reacted when they saw my mom in the dining room. They whispered and looked at each other the way people do when they see a celebrity. I guess being on a famous reality TV show kind of makes you a celebrity. Abuela held Annabelle's and George's hands as she said goodbye. She followed my mom to the kitchen, but insisted on talking to everyone on the way. They approached, and Abuela's face lit up when she saw me. I reached out for a hug. Even though I was already taller than Abuela, she still made me feel as little as when she'd read stories to me when I was younger. My favorite was El Raton Perez, about a mouse that fell into a pot of soup. Abuela did voices, and at the end of this and every story, she'd say, Y Colón, Colorado, este cuento se ha acabado. Now, most days, I read to her. My mom waited impatiently for Abuela. It seemed like Abuela enjoyed how uncomfortable my mom was because she kept introducing her to to guests. My mom and Abuela loved each other so much, but there was always this kind of friction between them because they were so different. While they were next to each other like this, the differences were pretty obvious. They looked like total opposites. Abuela was tall and slender, and my mom was much shorter and had powerful hands and a strong build. I turned back to the dining room, which was totally full. Aunt Tootie talked to people as they waited to be seated. Mari and Yolanda served tables while other friends and family bussed or ran food or prepared drinks for guests. The front door opened, and a man dressed in a crisp white suit and wide-brimmed hat walked in. He took off his hat as soon as he entered and then smiled brightly at Aunt Tootie. Aunt Tootie moved around the hostess stand to greet him, and the man took her hand and kissed it. She turned around, and I could see that she was blushing. The man took a menu from Aunt Tootie and walked toward the bar. He smiled and very politely bowed and said hello to everyone who made eye contact with him. Abuela watched the man cross the dining room and take a seat on one of the bar stools. He tipped his head to Abuela. She smiled, but not in her usual warm way. My mom was still trying to get Abuela out of the dining room, so I don't think she noticed the man. 
Abuela walked over, and as soon as she got near, the man stood up and took her hand. He went to kiss it, but she took it back before he could. It didn't seem like she wanted to accept such a gesture from someone she clearly didn't know. Doña Veronica, the man said to Abuela. Si, Abuela responded. Soy Wilfrido Pipo, he said, showing off a mouthful of perfect white te teeth. I just opened an office a few blocks away. Bienvenido, Wilfrido, as Abuela responded. Gracias, he said. There was something off about the way Abuela had said welcome, like maybe she didn't really mean it. My mom took Abuela's arm once again, and they came back to the kitchen. When they got to me, Abuela let go of my mom and took my hand. Vamos a la casa, Arturito, she said. Estoy un poco cansada. Abuela told me she was tired as she looked back at the impeccably dressed man. I left the restaurant with her, but not before hearing the man compliment the menu. I wondered what kind of business he had opened up. When I asked Abuela, she said she didn't know. No sé quién es, mi amor, she said. While we walked, she, sang, she quietly sang a song she used to sing to me when I was a kid. I opened the gate to our apartment complex and walked Abuela to her unit on the first floor. She said she was pretty tired, so I helped her to her recliner. She closed her eyes almost immediately. I tried calling Mop and Bren. They weren't answering their phones, so I decided to get the mail and deliver it to each apartment. I had the master key because another one of my summer jobs was assistant apprentice super for my family's complex. I'd started digging through the mail when someone came up from behind and startled the frijoles out of me.